Hi, I'm Dr. V. I'm Chief of the Spine Pain Program at Bloor Pain Specialists, and today I'm going to be talking about MRI. That's an excellent question, and we see these words all the time. In fact, patients see these words all the time nowadays, and they get concerned. But really, this is such a vague and general term. Degeneration is uh, the act of aging. It means the, the discs have aged in some way, or they have changed from their normal structure in some way. But lots of tissues change over time, and we don't get concerned always. Sometimes it is concerning, sometimes it's not. With our skin, we get wrinkles. And although we don't like it, that doesn't mean we are symptomatic in terms of our skin. With our hair, the color changes. We get grays, we get whites later on, or we lose our hair entirely. And that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the top of our heads. We don't necessarily get alarmed about, well, with the degenerative disc disease, sometimes it is a structural abnormality that should be addressed urgently or soon or relatively quickly, but oftentimes it is a relatively benign condition. And in fact, there is ample data to support that going off of MRI findings alone, we really don't need to be that concerned. Well, when I tell that to a patient who's symptomatic, they look at me like I'm lying to them until I explain why. And that's what I'm going to do now. We have to think about what is a disc. A disc is a pillow between two bones, separating our vertebrae to cushion. And initially, this are bouncy, they're soft, they're protecting those bones with each step of our life, cushioning. But over time, they can harden, they can stiffen, they can flatten. Sometimes they can have bulges, sometimes they can have calcifications, thickening, tightening, tightening some of the spaces where the nerves pass through or along those discs. And in some of those cases, that they're going to become symptomatic. That is true. But when we compare data, when we compare MRIs of patients with low back pain and track them over time and compare data for patients with low back pain, with uh, degenerative disc disease and no back pain, there doesn't seem to be a difference. So the disc on its own does not really play a big role. In fact, there was one very well-designed paper that came out in August of 2021. About three and a half thousand patients were tracked for six years. They had initial MRIs, their back pain was assessed, they were treated, they lived their lives, and they had MRIs at follow-up. Their back pain was assessed at follow-up. Their pain scores were assessed at follow-up and at baseline. And the pain scores at baseline did differ for those with a lot of MRI findings, meaning that at least five things that were notable on their MRI comparing them to people who had more or less normal MRIs, less than five things. So if you had five things that were uh, identified on your MRI to say that, you know what, degenerative disc disease at different levels, maybe some facet uh, arthritis, or maybe a little misalignment here or there. If you count those to be five different problems, there was a 0 0.8 difference in a score of 0 to 10 in terms of pain scores. So the group that had five or more had just had slightly more pain at baseline. Six years later, they trended towards actually less pain than they had at baseline. And so what's interesting there is that, you know, the, the MRI findings really don't correlate with the clinical finding. And why is that? Because our efforts as human beings uh, will play a bigger role in our recovery. Our desire to move, our, our engagement in physiotherapy, our, our, our engagement in chiropractics, osteopathy, acupuncture, medical management, interventions, surgery in some cases, and doing things ourselves, being empowered to manage our own symptoms at home and outdoors, and really engaging in our own recovery has been shown to be the better way to improve our outcomes. Engaging in our own recovery does not mean we have an MRI at home. It doesn't mean we get therapeutic MRIs. There's no such thing as a therapeutic MRI. It doesn't mean that we have to be scanned at home to be better. And that picture 
with emphasis is just a picture. Now, does that mean it's useless? Absolutely not. It identifies what you look like inside. We use it as a diagnostic tool to help us, help you, so that we can give you the diagnostic information so that you can take the next steps and we can assist you with the next steps to your recovery. But it is a starting point. There are many ways to treat the underlying causes of back pain. And although the discs are in the back, there are many other things in the back. There are joints, there are ligaments, there's a movement between our vertebrae. There's our musculature. Our musculature does so much. We can do things like differential loading. We can, we can do all kinds of exercises at home. We can do yoga. We can do endurance exercises, pelvic tilt exercises. We can do interventions to help people that have acute symptoms. If somebody has a swollen nerve, they can come in for, for an epidural steroid injection into the space between discs and nerves so we can shrink the swelling of those nerves, shrink the swelling of discs to allow them to recover. But steroids don't last forever. And I've reviewed that in some previous videos, but realistically, it's the patient engagement in their own recovery that improves their outcomes. And that's why degenerative disc disease on its own is just a title. In short, wear and tear. The, it's evidence that the body was used and the disc is changed from what it would have looked like at baseline. Some people do need surgery, that is correct, but it's dependent on very specific physical exam and clinical findings, what people feel, how people function, rather than the MRI. In fact, there are numerous studies looking at disc morphology or the shape of a disc. How big is this disc? How much of it herniated? Relating that to surgical outcomes. Well, you do surgery on small discs, you do surgery on big discs. Well, you think you do surgery on a big disc, they're gonna get better. Small disc, not much of an improvement, but realistically, the outcomes when we follow them are very comparable this way or that. The size of the disc does not predict the outcome always. And so uh, we again have to tie back to the patient engagement in their own recovery. That's a very insightful question. You know, uh, most people don't know this, but smoking causes back pain. Most physicians know that. If you ask the average school-aged child, they'll tell you smoking is not good for you for cancer and for cardiac reasons. You ask a teenager, they might tell you, you know, cosmetic reasons, you know, skin changes and so on. But when it comes to back pain, well, a big part of our back is related to how our discs cushion our bones. If our discs are not cushioning our bones, our bones are hitting each other, then we get arthritic type pains in our back. If our muscles are not receiving uh, good blood flow, well, they're cramping up, they're building up lactic acid. Their lactic acid, even though we make it, is an acid, it's burning our muscle tissue, and that's causing us to have back pain. But when it comes to degenerative disc disease, when you think about the disc itself, well, the disc is an interesting tissue type. It doesn't have blood vessels. It's known as avascular, meaning that its nutrition, its oxygenation, the oxygen delivery is by something called diffusion or leaking. As blood vessels go by, some of that liquid, some of that oxygen will leak out of the blood vessel in the surrounding tissue. And that gets absorbed into the disc. Well, with nicotine use, nicotine narrows the diameter of a blood vessel. So instead of just having a giant pipe with lots of flow towards the disc or any other tissue type, muscle or otherwise, that nicotine causes those muscles inside the blood vessels to tighten up tight, 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 and you get less flow. More nicotine, less flow. And as you get less flow in a tighter muscular wall, you get less leak, and those discs get less nutrition. Then they start starving. Then they start become acidic, becoming acidic because they're building up their own lactic acid and that changes their metabolism, and then they age. And that, uh, that uh, has been proven in basic science data, looking at dis uh, tissue in the laboratory. It's been looking, uh, proven in animal models and in human beings following us clinically over time. 
There's a 2010 paper on Canadian patients looking at smoking outcomes as they relate to low back pain. And with uh, compared to non-smokers, daily smokers had more back pain. Now, that is a controlled finding, meaning that they did what's called a multivariate analysis. They looked at all kinds of other things. What do these people do? How active are they? What is their nutritional state? Are they obese? Are they thin? Because weight also plays a role with gravity on our joints and so on. They looked at their education status, their work type, and so on, to see what's contributing so that they can isolate just the impact of smoking. And they still found that smoking resulted in more back pain. Now, the, the, the finding was most prominent in young people. And in fact, the worst group was young men. When young men between the age of 20 and 29 were smokers, they had a relative risk or an increase in their uh, likelihood of having uh, low back pain of 87%. 87%. Why? Well, as although there's a, a whole complicated slew of events biochemically, in short, the starvation of those tissues from nicotine caused their backs to age. So those young men had bold spines. And when they stop smoking, those spines don't become new again. That's unfortunate as well, because that data has been looked at in various studies. Uh, when nicotine is taken out of the picture, will the disc regenerate? It doesn't always. There's some improvement in some studies, but it's inconsistent. And that is how smoking as a lifestyle choice can impact somebody's low back pain by impacting their discs, inducing degenerative disc disease, along with you know, their musculature and so on. Thanks for watching today's video. Please like and subscribe below. If you have any questions that you'd like us to address in a future video, please leave them in the comments area. If you want us to answer any questions about your care specifically, please contact the clinic directly.